Welcome to section 10.2. We are talking about the concept of a vector. Uh, vectors are a crucial piece that we are going to be using all the way until the very last day in Calculus 3. So here we're going to establish what it is. We're going to look at it visually and graphically, and we're going to look at it a little bit algebraically as well. So a vector is an object that has both magnitude and direction. And by magnitude, that's just another word for length. So a vector is an object that has both magnitude and a direction. So a lot of times when we describe vectors and how they work, um, we describe uh, particle motion. So a particle we say moves from point A to point B. The displacement vector V has initial point A and terminal point B. So initial, that would be like our starting point and terminal would be our ending point. So right here on this vector, we start at the point A, we draw this line and then draw an arrow at the tip of it and it's pointing directly to point B. Now notationally, uh, we could label this vector um, using a and b, but we've already called the vector v. Now you'll notice when you see vectors typed in text, whether that's in a book or in these notes or anything like that, notice that it is a bolded v. When we're doing them by hand, we don't bolden them by hand. The way that we write a vector, so this vector v, is using a little arrow on top of the letter, kind of like that. So just like a one, just like a half arrow, kind of like that, above whatever the letter is. That's our notation for vectors. Okay? But again, you'll see it bolded in the text. Now, if we consider another vector going from point C to point D, we'll call this vector U. Notice that the vectors V and U have the same direction, right? They're both pointed this way, and they both have the same length as each other. And they should, because I just copied this one over to here to make this. Um, so, but since V and U have the same direction and same length, they are equal. So we can say vector v equals vector u. So it doesn't matter where a vector exists. Okay, the vector could be somewhere somewhere over here. It, we can pick it up and like place it back down here, place it here. We can move it and place it over here. It doesn't matter. If two vectors have the same direction and the same length, they are the same vector, no matter where their physical location is in a plane or in space. Okay, so because V and U have the same direction and same length, they are the same vector. So mathematically, they are equal to each other, even though they are in different locations along a graph. We also need to establish the concept of a zero vector. A zero vector, written as a bolded zero, or if you're handwriting it, a zero with that arrow on top of it. The zero vector has a length of zero, so the zero vector, if you were to graph it, essentially it just looks like a point, right? So it's just, here it is. That's a vector that has a length of zero. Um, in 
uh, in theory, it doesn't seem like it would be that useful to us to have a vector that does nothing like this. Um, but in practice, we need the zero vector um, to employ a lot of the techniques that we use um, to work with it mathematically. We have to have some form of zero, like we do in algebra. Okay, so the zero vector is not the same thing as the number zero. It is a vector. It's just a vector that consists of all zeros. We can also combine vectors together. So if we have a particle moving from A to B, we can label that vector AB and then say it changes direction from B to C. So that would be a vector BC. So like here's our three points. So let's see, we'll do A, B, and C. So we have our vector AB has initial point A, terminal point B. So it starts at A, ends at B. And then the particle goes from B to C. The combined effect of these two pieces of particle motion, the particle has moved from A to C, which itself is the vector AC. So we would go from here to here. So notice that if we do A, B, and B, C, we start at A, we go this way, we end up at C. If we do this, we go from A and we end up at C. So both of these paths that we take here have the same starting point and the same ending point. They all start with the initial value A and they all end with the terminal value at C. So we can say that AC would be equal to AB plus BC. Again, because these in their net result, they all start at A and they end at C, ultimately. So AC would be equal to AB plus BC. So this brings us to the idea of vector addition. So if u and v are vectors positioned so that the initial point of v is at the terminal point of u, then the sum u plus v is the vector from initial point of u to terminal point of v. So in other words, we have vector u, and then it said v, initial point of v is at the terminal point of u, so that's right here, and there's our vector v. The sum u plus v is the vector from the initial point of u, so right here, to the terminal point of v, Oop, let me try that again, right there. So this is the vector u plus v. So, as a note, mathematically, these are equal because they start and they end at the same place. But u plus v itself is a new vector, right? Because this is a combination of multiple vectors. So, u plus v is a new vector. And an interesting thing here, if we were to consider, so consider this situation again. So we've got u and we've got v, and we take that vector, that u plus v right there. Consider if we took these in the opposite order. So we'll start at the same exact spot, but we'll take v first. So I'm gonna take that vector and that's right there. So that's v. And then we take the vector u, and that's u. Let me draw v a little bit better. 
And then we take the vector u like that. Notice we end up at the same terminal point as well. And this vector is the vector v plus u. So it's an interesting property about vector addition. u plus v is equal to v plus u. And this is by no means a proof of that statement. Um, but it's a good, pretty good proof of concept, at least. It gives us a good visualization as to why that would be true, even if it's not a definitive proof. So, And I say that because we will actually be proving this property a little bit later algebraically. So given a couple vectors here, for example, so here's the vector a, here's the vector b. Let's try drawing a plus b and b plus a. So we're going to have the vector a and the vector b. So that is the vector a plus b. I'll just highlight that for emphasis. That's the vector a plus b. Whereas if we do b plus a, so we get, there's b, and then a, something like, something like that. And then connect those. And that's b plus a. And if I've done my drawing well enough, these vectors should look exactly the same. They should have the same direction, the same length. Now, of course, if I'm doing this by hand, it's not going to look perfect, but hopefully we get the idea that they should be the same vector regardless of where their placement is on the page. We can also work with vectors that have been scaled using numbers. So vectors that are made larger or shorter using scalar multiplication. So if C is a scalar and V is a vector, the scalar multiple CV is the vector whose length is absolute value of C times the length of V and whose direction is the same if C is positive and is opposite if C is negative. All right, so if we multiply a vector by a scalar C, a scalar number, then it's going to increase the length or decrease the length by that constant. So like, for example, if you multiply a vector by two, then it's going to be twice as long. If you multiply it by five, it's gonna be five times as long. If you multiply it by one half, it's only gonna be half as long, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you multiply it by a negative number, it's also going to point in the opposite direction. Okay, so like a vector that was pointed this way would point back the other way. Uh, if the scalar or the vector were zero, so if it, we multiply by the number zero or by the vector zero, the result is the zero vector. So again, just as a note about those negatives, so negative v has the same length as v, but opposite direction. So let's look at a couple examples here. So if we take vector u and the vector v like this, and let's find u minus v. All right. So to find u minus v, so we're going to have u is there. Now the minus v, 
So that's going to be the same length as V, but exactly the opposite direction. So that's going to be minus V. And so that is the vector u minus v. If we take two vectors, a and b, and we want to find a minus 2b. Well, we'll start with a. That's a. Now for the b, to get 2b, we're going to double its length. So that would be 2b. And then the negative means that we would take it the opposite direction. So we're going to take this vector and put it right here. And start at our initial point from A, go to our terminal point from the negative 2B. And that's our new vector, a minus 2b. Now, when we're working with vectors, we don't always want to be drawing like curves and, you know, approximations. It's not a very efficient way of working with them. We want to be able to work with them algebraically. So what we can do is we can establish what we call component form of a vector. So if the initial point of a vector a is at the origin and the terminal point is at the form a1, a2, or a1, a2, a3, so it starts at the origin, it ends at some point, we can write the vector in component form. So that would be the vector a equals, we're going to have what looks like kind of a, like a triangular bracket, and then a1 comma a2, and then close that triangular bracket. Or if we're in the 3D case, triangular bracket, a1, a2, a3, close triangular bracket, Now, it's important to note that these are not points. These are the vectors that are pointing at those points. So like for this one, if this is the point a1, a2, this is the vector, the vector a. Right, this vector a1, a2. And if we're in 3D, and this is the point a1, a2, a3, and that's the vector a1, a2, a3. Okay, so we use this notation to distinguish between a point and a vector. The vector we get its length and direction using that point, which is why it's labeled still with a1 and a2 or a1, a2, a3. But we distinguish the vector from the point using the triangular brackets. This type of vector is called a position vector. This is a vector whose initial point is the origin. And remember, a vector is going to be exactly the same no matter where you pick it up and move it. As long as it has the same length and direction, it's going to be the same vector. It's just that it's simpler if we start our vectors from the origin 
And when we write them in this form, that's basically what we're doing. So even if we draw a vector between two points, the final form still gives us that length and direction, but starting at the origin instead. So let me show you kind of what that looks like here. So, okay, so first this example, write a vector from the origin to the point three, two in component form. So that would be, so like our vector A, that would just be the vector three, two. Right, so there's x, there's y, so 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Right there. That would be the vector 3, 2. So this is the position vector that is pointing at the point 3, 2. Now we can construct vectors that go between two points. So... Given the points A and B with these components, we can construct the vector A, which is basically the value AB here. All we have to do is take terminal minus initial. So kind of like the distance formula, just without all of the squaring. So we take x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, and z2 minus z1. Okay, so and again, this is terminal minus initial. So you take that ending point and you subtract off the components of the starting point the result that you get is the vector that is drawn between the two of them. Okay. So, like, just in general, like, if we had, you know, a vector pointed from here to here, and that's point A and that's point B, that vector between them can be found by taking the values of B minus the values of A, right? And the X component, the Y component, the Z component. When we find the formula for it, we're essentially going to be, let's see if I can do this. We're essentially just gonna be grabbing this vector, picking it up, and putting it right there at the origin. That's what the formula is going to show. That's what we mean when we talk about position vectors. All vectors are given in this position vector form as if they start at the origin, even the ones that go between two points like this. Okay, so it's more just a style of notation. It's just a way that we write these expressions. So let's take a look at the vector between these two points in 3D in this case. So the vector AB, so that's gonna be negative two minus two, comma, one minus negative three, comma, 1 minus 4. So that is negative 4, 4, negative 3. So this is the vector that would be drawn between these two points, put into its typical position vector form. Right. So now that we're working with this component form of vectors, um, we can also do some more stuff with it. Um, we can determine the magnitude or length of a vector. So the notation that we use for this is going to be either that um, kind of that absolute value looking symbol that we've seen before, or you can see it sometimes with double bars like this. Um, both of those notations are equivalent and are both valid. Um, so it just a lot of times depends on like personal preference or maybe context. Um, so but you will potentially see both of these being used periodically, they both mean the same thing. The length of a two dimensional vector. Uh, so a one a two is going to be 
So magnitude of A is the square root of A1 squared plus A2 squared. And the length of the three-dimensional vector A is going to be the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. Now, where do these formulas come from? Well, actually, they come from the distance formula that we were just talking about in the previous section. Um, because remember, these components of the vector are found by usually subtracting the values between two points. So this would be like x2 minus x1 squared, and y2 minus y1 squared, and z2 minus z1 squared. Take the square root of that. That is the distance formula. So we're just kind of reframing formulas that we already know in the context of vectors and putting them into this more consistent notation. To work with vectors algebraically, we deal with their components. So if you take two vectors a and b, and you want to add a plus b, that's the same thing as taking a1, a2, plus b1, b2. And you're going to add component by component. So the first components go together, and the second components go together. So this is a1 plus b1, comma, a2 plus b2. For subtraction, you do the same kind of thing. So we would get a1 minus b1 and a2 minus b2. And for constant multiples, so this would be the same thing as c times a1, a2. You can distribute constant multiples to every component within the vector. So this will be ca1 and ca2. So let's take a look at an example. So we have two vectors, 4, 0, 3, and negative 2, 1, 5. So let's find the following. So first, we're going to find the length of A. So the length of A, we're going to take the square root of 4 squared plus 0 squared plus 3 squared. So that's 16, 0, and 9. So that's radical 25, which is 5. So the length of this vector would be 5. If we wanted to find a plus b, that would be 4, 0, 3 plus negative 2, 1, 5. So we would go component by component, so that would be 4 and then minus 2, 0 plus 1, and 3 plus 5. So that would be 2, 1, 8. So that would be our new vector a plus b. And say we wanted something a little more complicated. So 2a plus 5b. So that would be 2 times 4, 0, 3, plus 5 times negative 2, 1, 5. So we multiply in those constants, so 8, 0, 6, and then negative 10, 5, 25. And then add, so we get 8 minus 10, 0 plus 5, 6 plus 25.
and we get negative 2, 5, and 31. There are a lot of different properties of vectors that we can use to our advantage. Uh, a lot of these properties mirror properties from algebra. Um, so working with just numbers, okay? Now vectors are not numbers, right? They are combinations of values that are put into separate components um, that give us a magnitude and a direction. So, if we have the vectors a, b, and c are vectors in v sub n, so this is a vector of degree n. So like if you had like v2, that would be two-dimensional vectors. If you had v3, it's three-dimensional vectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, get rid of that. Um, and c and d are scalars. Then all of these following properties are going to be true. Uh, a plus b equals b plus a. So we visualized that earlier. We're actually going to prove it here in just a second. But you can change around the order of vector addition. A plus the quantity B plus C equals quantity A plus B plus C. So the order in which you add them will not matter. You can add these two first and then add A. You can add these two first and then add C. Or any combination therein. Any vector plus the zero vector is itself... Okay, so a plus the zero vector is a. Any vector plus its own opposite is zero, right? And this is the zero vector, not just the number zero. So a plus the opposite of a is the zero vector. Scalars can distribute across addition for vectors, so ca plus cb. Vectors can distribute across scalar addition, like this, so ca and da. You can move around scalars into and out of this multiplication here. So CD times A is the same thing as C times DA or D times CA. And if you take the number one times a vector, that vector remains itself. So this is multiplying anything by one is just creating itself. Okay. Now, None of these give us any indications about multiplying vectors to each other, right? This is all scalar multiplication. We'll talk more about the concept of vector multiplication and really what ways we have of doing something like that in the next couple of sections. So let's go ahead and prove that first property. So we saw it visually earlier. Let's actually prove it algebraically here. Um, and we're going to go ahead and prove it in V2. Um, you can't, we can prove it. It's the same proof for all of Vn, but just that we don't take up a lot of space and time here. Um, so we're going to take A plus B. So if we're in V2, so it's going to be A1, A2 plus B1, B2. Uh, we can go ahead and add these together. So A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2. Now, the the catch here, the trick to these like vector style proofs, um, everybody's always tempted. They're like, oh, well, I need to get B plus A. Oh, I'll just switch them like that. The problem is that that defeats the whole purpose of the proof. You are trying to prove that we can switch them. Um, and so just going in and just switching their order um, doesn't actually prove anything. So what we need to do, and that's going to be the case with most of these vector style proofs, is we want to combine everything together. So now we have these components. Everything within these components are all constants. So these are all just real numbers in here. And because this is just constants and numbers, we, can, we know we can switch these around because that's what we learn in algebra, right? Algebra tells us that 1 plus 2 is the same thing as 2 plus 1, right? It doesn't matter the order we add them in. So we can use algebra to then switch the order. So then that's B1 plus A1 
comma b2 plus a2. And now we can undo that vector addition that we had done. So we can go ahead and split this back up, but notice now the b's are in front of the a's. So that would give us b plus a. And we just put a little box that just signifies that the proof is done. So this type of proof, I know it, it probably seems uh, trivial um, to have to combine and then switch and then split it back up again. Um, but this is how mathematical proof works. It needs to be um, very analytical, very precise, um, and we cannot make assumptions that we have not proven yet. Um, so, and again, this is how a lot of these vector style proofs are going to go, is working within the components where the numbers are, as opposed to working with the vectors themselves. So, and all of these properties get proven very similarly to this. Now, in addition to the component form of the vector, so that a1, a2, a3, or that x, y, z um, that we have, we can also come up with an alternative form using what are called the standard basis vectors. The standard basis vectors are going to be the vectors i, which is the vector 1, 0, 0, j, which is the vector 0, 1, 0, and k, which is the vector 0, 0, 1. Uh, if you've encountered these vectors before, I know some, some instructors like using like this hat notation on them. Um, I don't do that, but if you have encountered them in this form before in a different class, um, you're welcome to use that notation. It's not that big a deal. Um, but these are the standard basis vectors. So these vectors, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So that would be the i vector right there, the j vector right there, and the k vector right there. We call these the standard basis vectors. Um, because they basically form a basis of all other vectors. Basically, any other vector can be written as some combination of i, j, and k. So if we take a vector a, so the components are a1, a2, and a3. If we do something to what, similar to what we did on the last page, split this up into separate vectors being added together, so like a1, 0, and 0, plus uh, 0, a2, 0, plus 0, 0, a3. So notice, like at any point in time, we could recombine these and get back to here again. So we haven't changed the identity of the vector. We've just split it so that the x's are all in one vector, the y's are in one vector, and the z's are in a vector. Now, we know that constants can get distributed in. They can also get factored out. So I'm going to factor an a1 out of this first vector. And because these components are 0, they're going to stay 0. So I'm going to factor out an a1, and we're going to be left with a 1, 0, 0. Factor out the a2, 0, 1, 0. And factor out the a3 to get a 0, 0, 1. And these are the standard basis vectors. So we get a equals a1i plus a2j, plus a3k. So this is an alternative way of writing a vector, not in the component form, 
but in its what we call standard basis form, or as a simplification, just the IJK form of the vector. Um, so each of these, the I, the J, and the K, correspond to the three components of the component form of the vector, so the A1, the A2, and the A3. So we want to be comfortable using both of these notations interchangeably because they do represent the same thing. So, but this is the standard basis form of the vector. So, for example, if we have the vector i plus 2j minus 3k and the vector 4i plus 7k, and let's say we wanted to find 2a plus 3b. So everything works exactly the same way. So you get 2 times i plus 2j minus 3k plus 3 times 4i plus 7k. So we get 2i plus 4j minus 6k. So distribute that in plus 12i plus 21k. And now when we combine via addition, we just go component by component. So that means we're going to add the i components together. We're going to add the j components together. Notice that there is no j component on this second one. Um, that just means that that's a zero component. So that's the same thing as zero j on that. And then we have the uh, k components being combined as well. So we've got 2i and 12i, so that's 14i plus 4j, 21 minus 6 is plus 15k. Or if we were going to look at that in its component form, that would be the vector 14, 4, 15, like that. And those would represent the same thing. We also need to talk about the concept of the unit vector. A unit vector is something that we're going to be using pretty frequently throughout the course. This is a vector that has a length of 1. The vector has a length of 1. That makes it a unit vector. It has unit length. A unit vector can be found, so we call it u, by taking a vector a and dividing by the length of that vector. So we take a vector, divide by its own length, and in doing so, if the vector had like a length of 5, we divide it by 5, now it has a length of 1. Uh, the reason that we need unit vectors a lot, especially later on, uh, is because in a lot of our calculations, we want the direction of the vector, but we don't want the length to throw off our calculations. Like I said, if this has a length of 5, and I start using it everywhere, all of my calculations are going to be scaled up by 5, and maybe I don't want that. So I divide away the length so that the length or magnitude is not changing our results. So find a, a vector in the direction of 2i minus j minus 2k with a length of 1. So we're looking for a unit vector. So we're going to take 2i minus j minus 2k and we're going to divide by its own length. So we need to remember how to find the length of a vector from just a couple pages ago. That's going to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So that's going to be 2 squared plus negative 1 squared plus negative 2 squared. So 
So that's going to be, that's 4, 1, and 4. So that's 9. Square root of 9 is 3. And we can go ahead and split this up component by component here. So that's going to be 2 thirds i minus 1 third j minus 2 thirds k. And if you're ever not sure, you can go back and like double check yourself. You can take the length of this vector. So we can check it. And then plus negative one third squared plus negative two thirds squared. So that would be four ninths plus one ninth plus four ninths. So it'd be nine ninths or radical one, which is one. So that is in fact a unit vector. It is a vector of length one. And that brings us to the end of section 10.2. Uh, in the upcoming sections, we're going to be looking at the different forms of quote unquote vector multiplication. Um, vector multiplication is not as straightforward as just doing what we would think of as algebraic multiplication. There are different ways we have to go about doing that. And we're going to encounter those in the next couple of sections as we continue our work through chapter 10. But that brings us to the end of this section and to our introduction to vectors.